in their generation and the world is better because they pass by. God bless you. That was especially done for both of you. I just wanted to show my gratitude in a special way with the help of our AY leader, Michelle Coombs. At this moment, I would read a little background for each individual. I would start with Daphne Montgomery. He was born in Salem, Alabama on April 18, 1923. Mr. Montgomery was drafted into Army Air Force now the United States Army Force during World War II and served in the 1051, 51st Quartermaster Company of the 96th Air Service Group, Air Fighter Group, uh, attached to the 32nd Air Fighter Group, as a ground crewman with the Tuskegee Airmen in southern Italy from 1943 to 1945. He was awarded a Good Conduct Medal, the World War II Victory Medal, European African Middle Eastern Service Medal, with two bronze stars, a service award, the Honorable Service Medal, and a Basic Driver Mechanical Medal. He is a charter member of the Phoenix Club and was one of the first to be admitted in the Gamma Mu chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. Mr. Montgomery was an act, activist in the course of the Civil Rights Movement and marched with the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King throughout the 50 plus mile march from Salem, Montgomery, Alabama, March 21st to 25th, 1965. He served as one of Dr. King's bodyguards. Now, Daphne Montgomery, welcome. And some history background for Dr. Hazel Dukes. She is the president of the NAACP New York State Conference and a member of the NAACP National Board of Directors, a member of the NAACP Executive Committee, and as well as an active member of various NAACP board subcommittees. Dr. Dukes is a woman of great strength and courage. Her dedication to human rights and equality is exemplified by her role linking businesses, government, and social causes. Dr. Dukes is an active and dynamic leader who is known for her unselfish and devoted track record for improving the quality of life in New York State. Welcome, Dr. Hazel Dukes. At this time, I would call on Marcel Hamilton. He'll be our first narrator to ask some question to Mr. Montgomery. Well, first, let me start by saying welcome. I think on behalf of uh, this church and, and also all fellow pilots, it's definitely an honor to be sitting here with a living legend uh, in aviation going through school. We've heard about the Tuskegee Airmen and it's amazing to actually sit down with uh, a man like this. So welcome, welcome. Now, Mr. Montgomery, you're now a, live, a legendary figure as a Tuskegee Airman. Um, when you and your other illustrious comrades fought in World War II, you served in a segregated military. Please give us a glimpse of what life was like back then for you, uh, flying back, back then, as well as even now. I have in my hand here a document. Uh, it's dated April 27th, 1918. It's now unclassified information. But in those days, it was classified. It was the property of the War Department of the United States of America. And in this document, this is a copy of it, and you can take your computer and get anything these days. 
Here is a special study of black men, a spe special 67 page study of what they thought of black men in those days. And it has to do with what kind of fighter do you think the black man is or was? And it clearly states here that the black man, according to this study, did not have a spine. He could not be depended upon to do anything. He didn't have the brain to be trained as a pilot in the armed forces of the United States. The other is, according to here, are smaller than the articles of a Caucasian man. And because his arteries are smaller, he cannot adjust to the training of the pilot who has to take dives and climbs and sharp curves. His brains could not adjust to those quick changes. This article was written by people with their MDs, PhDs, but didn't have the love of God in their heart. And they concluded that we was not able to be trained as a good fighter. And therefore, had no place in the Air Force of the United States of America. Now, when this came out, of course we said, no, I can't. And there was several young black men who applied to be trained as pilots in the Army Air Corps. And because they were black, they would say, no, we have no place to train you. And they thought again, and they communicated with the press, and a few politicians in that era, 1918, now at this time, it was about 1937, uh, 38, when we were going into World War II, that they wanted to be pilots and they wanted to be trained and they had to be, they had to been told no, they couldn't because they was not prepared mentally to be trained. And the politician and the black press put pressure on the war department to find some way, somewhere, to train these black men who wanted to be pilots. That's what they thought of us. Need I say more? <laughs> wow. Was there a moment when you and your comrades felt back then that what you were doing would ever make history? Yes. When we were finally accepted, let me tell you, I was not a pilot. I would like to tell you that I was a, a P-51 fighter pilot. But I was a ground crewman. How many of you saw uh, the, the uh, 
Red tails. Let's see hands. How many of you? Okay. Those of you who have not seen red tails, find it and see it again. <laughs> I see it for the first time. And you will find uh, these strong young men doing their share toward keeping this nation from being invaded by the German and their racism. And uh, these men were not afraid. They were led by a gentleman named Benjamin O. Davis. Benjamin O. Davis was a young, tall, black man who was a West Pointer. And at the time he was in West Point, he was the only black cadet there. And they put what they call the silent treatment on him. Nobody would speak to him as long as he was in outside of a classroom. When he came and sat down, studied lesson, reported to teachers, yes. But the moment he left that room and went to his dormitory or out on the campus, nobody would speak to him. For four years, this happened. He didn't sit down and cry about it. He stood up and he was a man. I can. And in spite of this treatment, after four years, he was number 37 in a class of 285. <laughs> Give him a hand. This, what it means to us to believe in oneself. First, believe in God. Amen. And he will give you that confidence in yourself that will cause you to stand up and say, I can, I know. And this is what he gave us, that urge to stand up and say, I can, when others said, you cannot. And he handed it down to us. God was working through him and others. And it gave us that strength to stand up and say, we can. Let me tell you of the toughest day in World War II for me. The toughest day in World War II for me and many of my friends, we were in charge of all the food and clothing for the 13,000 men involved in this experiment. Every pilot you saw in the air, there were 13 to 15 men on the ground taking care of the business of that pilot. And one of the toughest days, in fact, the toughest day in my life was to be housed in the southern part of Italy, south of a mountain that is called Vesuvius. Many of you have re read about Mount Vesuvius eruption two, three hundred years ago when thousands or hundreds of people got killed when the lava came down. But in 1944, Mount Vesuvius erupted again. Imagine this is behind us. You cannot fight. You cannot stand up for what is truth and right. Imagine official document from the United States government. Imagine 
Mount Vesuvius, the eruption, the fire coming down, the ash, the cinders, so thick until we had to put on gas masks for 12 hours. Imagine the dust again. And there was this. That was Mount Vesuvius. And if you look on top of here, where is the bullet? You see two bullets. Two bullets. Thank you. This is the size of the German bullet. This is actually one. They should shoot 100 of these per minute. This is the size of the American bullet. And I too, these bullets were made, or cannons were made back in the 30s and late 40s. And my friend who did research work in World War II gave these to me or shared these with me. But imagine this one coming at you when this was on you. And Mount Vesuvius was coming down with fire and brimstone. We stood up and said, I can, I will, and I will fight back. And with the help of God, we won. With the help of God, we won. Because we had that faith and confidence in ourselves. In spite of all that they say we could not do. We stood up and did it. And we showed the world that we are men. And in spite of this, we didn't hate. Hate is a waste of time, a waste of energy, a waste of everything. To the young fellas and girls, especially the children around, use your mind to think and to solve problems. You have no time to say, I cannot. But the God who gave you this beautiful, beautiful church, who gave you the beautiful sun that you see out there, will give you strength to solve your problems. And energy to work hard. And you can do it. I know it. So in spite of all that we had to go through, we stood up and said, we can do it. And we did it. For the first time in the history of war, one man took a P-51 and he sank a German destroyer in the Mediterranean Sea. And this had never been done before. And his skin was the color of my, the back of my hand. For the first time, Charlie McGee, whose skin is also the color of my skin flew behind the enemy lines 409 times, set a record that has never been broken in World War II, the Korean War, never has been broken. A black man did it and they were saying, you cannot 
fly a plane, boy. And he breaks the record and he sinks their destroyer that never had been done before. Yes. You can do it, young people. You can do it. Have that faith in God, in family, yes, in yourself. You can do it in spite of the trouble. What is your next question? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll go to Dr. Dukes at this time. Dr. Dukes, a couple of questions. Um, but before we do that, I have a colleague of mine, which all of this is possible only because of her. And I tell you, in life, sometimes it's who you know and who they know and who they know, right? So I know very special people. And please, one day she said to me, what is this church you go to? And God knew, I did not, I didn't have a clue that this would ever happen. And I want you to turn around, look. And this is where I spend my Saturdays, which is my Sabbath. <laughs> Everyone, this is Miss Henrietta Lai. Say hi. Hi. Thank you so much, and thank you for inviting us. Um, Teresine was so pleased about our Black History event at our job, SBS, that she said, is it possible? She, not, no, she didn't say it like that. She really bugged me many days <laughs> about the possibility. And I said, all we can do is ask. And we did. And Dr. Dukes, Mr. Montgomery, and of course, Amelia Montgomery said yes, just like that. And she was the happiest person. I just have to say, I'm also chairperson of Community Board 10 in Manhattan. And long before that, Dr. Deuce was a friend of mine, but she's on the board and she holds me up. And Mr. Montgomery's on the board also. So not only are they incredible legends in our community and throughout the United States, they also work in their local community board, okay? They're giving back in that way too, and we could not. To have people like this on a local community board is major. So I wanna thank them again for basically coming out to Tercian's church, because I'm always asking about this church on Saturday, and we have little battles, but I'm so glad to be here. And Ms. Montgomery, of course, you know I love you. Thank you so much for always making things happen, and of course, Dr. Dukes and Mr. Montgomery, I can't say enough about you in, in doing this today for all of us. Thank you so much. So, can you? Okay, at this time I have the pleasure of interviewing Dr. Hazel Dukes. Dr. Dukes, welcome. My first question for you is, would you please take us back to a time when you made a conscious decision to serve as a civil rights activist? And additionally, what ultimately drew you to the oldest and most widely recognized civil rights organization, the NAACP? Good evening. Good evening. I am overjoyed to be here with you this afternoon. I am glad that Ms. William introduced our person who really is responsible for all of this, Mrs. Lyre. And I want to uh, personally say thank you for intervening that we will uh, be here. I come from a family in Montgomery, Alabama, and my father, youngest sister, the baby girl, they belong to Seven Day Adventist, so I'm at home here. My grandmother, my uncle is the elder, and my aunt is over the, the ministry of women within the Seventh-day Adventist. She travels all over. Her name is Laura Smith. They both are retired educators now, and they still live in Montgomery, Alabama. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. My dad was a Pullman porter. I had a chance to meet A. Philip Randolph as a child. I heard conversations around the table of these men talking about 
how they was going to move their profession, which was being Pullman porters. I know the young people don't know anything about that. But let me tell you, that was a middle class job. Teaching postal workers and railroad workers was middle class people. That was the jobs that our people had in the, in the uh, early 30s, the 20s and the 30s, they began to hire. And so my dad was uh, a Philip Randolph organized union. As you know, he was the catalyst for the March on Washington. A. Philip Randolph and Brian Rustin was the catalyst for that. And so my first year in college was at, my, at Alabama State University now. It was Alabama State Teachers College. And an old, well he was, well he was old to us because I was a freshman. He came to the college to talk about African Americans, in that time it was Negroes. Uh, they were beginning to look at how Negroes could move out of certain communities and move and spread out. And he said to us uh, in the class, um, he said, I want you young people to know something. I was 17 years of age. He said, I want you to know that don't let anybody tell you that politics is not a part of your life. He said, you are born into politics and you die into politics. So we all like, born? No, my mother birthed me. Well, what are you talking about? He said, because someone signed your birth certificate. And when you die, someone signed your death certificate. And he said, they can be appointed or elected. He said, and people who make decisions about what your light bill is going to be and your water bill is going to be, they are politicians. They're not your next door neighbor. They're not your mother. They're not your father. They are people who have a part of your life. And so I was sitting there and I heard that. And being my daddy's child, because my mom was humble, housewife, didn't get into, but I always was nosy. <laughs> and always wanted to know what made the world go around. Was it flat, round? I just wanted to argue about things. They thought I was going to be a lawyer because I had a lot to say about everything. <laughs> and so I decided that this is for me. And so we moved from Montgomery to Queens. We lived on Farmers Boulevard here in Queens. And my dad, because my dad was transferred uh, from uh, Montgomery to run what was called then the Chicago Line. That was the name. And so I got involved in Queens with uh, persons who, some are deceased. The, she, uh, Dora Young, served as the clerk for Queens County. She was an African-American woman. She served as a queen. The street that is named out here, Guy Ara Brewer Boulevard, he was the first African-American from Queens to be elected assemblyman. And I received the Guy Ara Brewer Award from the Black and Puerto Rican Caucus many years ago. So I got involved in pursuing, I went to all white college graduated from Adelphi University in Garden City. Very, very Irish, but I even made a dent there. I was so uh, excited that they didn't have any African-American teachers that I uh, got a group together. Uh, Greg Meeks, your congressman out here, came after me. I was a junior when Greg came uh, there and a congressman, then he became congressman, Ed Towns, they came to Adelphi. But I was so uh, incensed that African Americans was coming to this college and paying our money and there was nobody like us. So I started a little group there. <laughs> Social group. I was organized. I don't know why I didn't become a social worker either. 
<laughs> but anyway, and so that's where I got my start, looking at the world, looking at things that I came uh, 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 among and just seeing that it wasn't real, that because the color of our skin, we were not at the table where decisions were being made, that we wasn't there for our, for us as a young person, and I hope the young people, and Ms. William, you've done a great job to have young people out on a Saturday, a special, a beautiful Saturday, that they're not out at the mall or someplace else, but they're here to learn their history because our young people don't get this in school. They don't have it. Uh, our poor community is so fragmented. We don't have grandmothers to tell the story. I was blessed. I was reared with both grandmothers on my dad's side and on my mother's side. So I heard the stories. It wasn't about, and I didn't have, I remember my doll being made out of, a rag, out of rags, but she was beautiful because my grandmother made my doll. And our children don't have that sense anymore, and that's what we were lost, uh, to know that when Mr. Montgomery tell you, you can, the confidence. Our children don't have it because we have stopped giving it to them. Because as Mr. Montgomery said, when he opened up, if you don't know where you have been, you don't know where you're going. And so our children don't know the hardship, the sacrifice that was made by men and women of color and they think that we, African Americans, have not contributed anything to America because the TV don't show them. All they want to show is us being locked up. They don't tell our children that it wouldn't be a red light. They don't tell our children it wouldn't be a washing machine. They don't tell our children that Mary McLeod Methune built a college out of selling peanuts. And then here's Mr. Montgomery, the Tuskegee Airmen, that did something that no other man has done. And our children don't know it. It's not in the curriculum. We don't go to school to fight for it. We don't go to PTA meetings. And so our children think they're less than other children. But I want you young people to know, when Mr. Montgomery tell you you can, you most certainly can. Amen. Because those Tuskegee Airmen live through holy hell. Yes. Yes. But yet, they prevail, yes. and history had to record. Yes. <laughs> history had to because it's a story that's worth telling. Young people, we are kings and queens. Yeah. Obama, President Obama, is there because people who could not even read their name sacrificed. I went to a convention that Fannie Lou Hamer said to white America, I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. She changed the whole political system around a woman, an African American woman, way before Bella Abzu, way before those people came on the scene. It was an African American woman that changed it. But nobody tell our children that. And so they believe, as Mr. Montgomery showed you, that we, that our men was three-fifths of a man, and that we African-American women were only their sex play. That was the slave master image of us. And so we, today, as Charles 
Chaplain Black said, there is footprints in the sand of times. And we are now re almost repeating what happened before the Civil Rights March. Two weeks ago, the newspaper said New York City schools was the most segregated in the country. What are we doing about it? You pay taxes. You pay more taxes than some other people pay. All of these things that we have fought for, Mr. Montgomery and the Airmen, Tuskegee Airmen, the list is long. Shirley Chisholm. The history is there, but if you don't know it, you repeat the same mistakes and you're doomed to fail. And for me, I was not going to fail. I was going to break the glass ceilings. I was going to fight because I knew that I had it up here because my grandmother told me. She said, if you get it up here, they can call you anything they want to. And they did. They used to say, any, meeny, miny, more. Catch a nigga by his toe. If he holler, let him go. Any, meeny, miny, more. And you know what my grandmother said to me? She said, yeah, we'll have much more because you're going to be smarter than any of them. Yeah. And as Montgomery said, I was never taught to hate. Yeah. Never taught to hate. Yeah. I was taught to be smart. Dr. Dukes, can you tell us what drew you towards becoming a member of the NAACP? My college. College, it was very active. Uh, youth and college uh, chapters, which we still have now. In the NAACP, there's the Youth and College Division, where young people from all over the walks of life participate in many activities. They have a program that is called, the acronym is AXO, where young people who want to be engineers, lawyers, and doctors, they compete at a local level and then go on nationally. So that drew me as a young person into honing my skills uh, to be a speaker that I am today by being a chance at my church, as Mr. Montgomery said, my foundation is in rooted in the African-American heritage, which God's first, Amen. and everything else will come after. For those of us who don't know, can you tell us what the an acronym NAACP stands for and maybe it's a little the, bit about the function of the group? It's National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And when the Black Power Movement started, and the black nationalists came on the scene. They said, why are you talking about you, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People? Yeah. Thurgood Marshall said, people come in all colors. Look around you now. Do you want a salad with just lettuce in it? <laughs> Don't you want your salad to be beautiful? You put tomatoes in it, you put carrots in it, you put some beets in it, you put some pickle in it, you put some green peppers, you put some yellow peppers. That's America. As our former mayor, David Dinkins said, we are mosaic. We are mosaic. And so if you're gonna start from the Christian part of life, for us, we want everybody to be equal, don't we? So if we don't go do that, why don't we say we want everybody to advance? We don't want to be like the other people. We are Christians. Amen. 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 Then NAACP was founded on Christianity Amen. of the black church. A white woman on Fifth Avenue, Mary White Overton, was listening to the radio, wasn't television. And she heard that they were lynching black men in Springfield, Illinois. 
She called together people at her home on Fifth Avenue. She called black and white Jew and Gentile to her home. So it wasn't founded by black folks. <laughs> it was not founded by black folks. Go on the, go on the internet, young people, and look at the history. Mary White Overton, white lady, on Fifth Avenue in New York City, was listening to the radio of black men being lynched in Springfield. It wasn't in New York. And two years ago on Father's Day, we put 17,000 people on the street in New York City. That's how we got stop and frisk off the book of the police. We silent marched. We didn't have no drum beating. We didn't have no hey, hey, ho, ho. We made a stand. We marched down Fifth Avenue, not saying a word. Not saying a word. You couldn't hear anything but pity pat the feet. Sometimes you don't have to talk. People don't know what's on your mind. So that's what the NAACP is about. And all those people who tried to put it down is gone by the wayside. This year, this year, July the 24th, NAACP, well, really, the birthday was February the 12th. It's a 105 year old organization. 105. It's an old ship of Zion. It has landed many of thousands. Thurgood Marshall, the first African American, and Clarence Thomas ought to be ashamed of himself to be sitting up there where a man gave so much that he cannot think or give back to African American people. He would have never been there if it hadn't have been. That is awesome. I have a question for you, Mr. Montgomery. How many of, of your comrades, including yourself, make up the original Tuskegee Airmen? Mm -hmm. How many? Let's see. It was about 18,000 ground crew and pilot all together. How many exist right now? We estimate 150. How many went to the White House with you? What Tell them when you went to the White House, when the president, how many of you, how many of you went to the White House to get the congressional medal? Oh, yeah. How many went to the, eight, if 300 of us went to the White House. Really, the White House wasn't big enough. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they had to put it in the Capitol. And they found 300 still alive. Now there are more. Some of the Tuskegee Airmen just came out and just faded out into life. I had one close friend who died one month before we received that award. But they did find the 300 of us to give that Mr. award Pitcher. to. My wife is uh, handing me a, a picture Tell them the experience, though, of the White House, Mr. Montgomery. That's the White House. When you went to the White House. Yes. Tell them what happened when you went to the White House. Here is a picture of Tuskegee Airmen in the White House, invited there by President Obama. Wow. Amen. And Amen. He invited us there to see the movie picture, the movie uh, flying red tails. red tails. And he gave us a reception. But what I want to put across, this was 61 years or more after the fight was over. Stand up for truth and right. And it might not come today, but hang in there. Don't give up, don't compromise. And tomorrow, 
it'll come. And these 18 of us were invited to the White House and they had a reception and I kissed Mrs. Obama two times. <laughs> But don't give up when you're right. Don't compromise. Stand there and fight. Not in hate again. Not in name calling, but it's stand up for truth and right. Then it'll come to you. It's gonna to come to you. And every generation has to fight for its rights. The Ku Klux Klan have pulled the white things off their head. And they have put on vested suits and neckties. But they have the same mindset. You gotta stand up against them and say, I am not compromising. I was blessed to testify on the Senate floor in 2011, I believe it was. And on the Senate floor, I say that you extreme Republicans and Democrats, you are trying to break the contract that God had with poor people. But I have news for you. Your arms are too short to box with God. Uh, now, as a civil rights activist, I read that you had a special relationship with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, you were actually, in, in your bio, I highlights that you served as a bodyguard for Dr. King. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Let me tell you what led up to that. When I came from the army, we were talking about victory at home and overseas. First thing I did when I came out with my honorable discharge is go to Dallas County. She's from Montgomery, 50 miles away from me. <laughs> I'm from Selma. I went to register to vote. And the white ladies behind the desk gave me three applications and said that these three applications have to be filled out by three white men. So I took the application and ran out and found three white men to fill them out and each one gave me a lecture on, boy, don't start any trouble around here. <laughs> took them back to the lady and she looked at him and said, okay, but do you own $1,000 worth of property in the state of Alabama. You know, I just got home from the army. I'm still with my mother and father. But you cannot vote because you don't own $1,000 worth of property in the state of Alabama. And I stood there and pointed my hand at the system in the back of that room. As this white fella came up to the desk, I came to register to vote. She registered that board to vote, no problem. And I stood in the back and pointed my finger at the system. And I said, what can I do to change this system? Because as I pointed one finger at the system, I was pointing three fingers at myself. And I became later involved with Martin Luther King. I had gone to Selma before Martin Luther King because I went and studied religion. 
Everybody was telling me that you do so much church work, you should be a preacher. My pastor came to me and said that God had come to him and told him to come to me to go into the ministry. You go back and tell God to come and tell me. <laughs> Don't give me a second call. I didn't get a second call. I didn't get a call. But I got this passion as I received a degree in religion. When the law of the state violated the conscience of man, the law of the state should be peacefully broken. 1949, you are to go back to Selma and peacefully break the segregated law. Peacefully break it, it says. And do not hate or fight. Just stand up for what you have done. And that's what I did. And that's eventually how I became involved with Martin Luther King. When I was sitting in New York City on Convent Avenue, and I was looking at ABC Network, and that was Adolf Hitler killing the Jews by the thousand. And uh, the commentator said, this could never happen in America. And he said, let me interrupt this program to bring you a special bulletin from Selma, Alabama. And he opened his camera to Selma, and there were my friends crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge and they attacked them with dogs and gas. And they had gas masks on. And many of these people I knew that I saw being attacked. And I packed my things and went back to Selma, Alabama and became involved with Martin Luther King. And the nonviolent approach to the solution to segregation. And we marched to 53 miles. And there, when we marched to 53 miles, you see some hills up there. When we completed the 53 miles from Selma to Montgomery, I took the heels off my shoes, and here they are. And I said, I'll use these for souvenirs. This is a necktie that I wore. And Martin Luther King guided my hand that I wrote his home address in Atlanta, here in this little book in 1952. I knew him when he was working on his PhD at Boston University. And we had the same godmother. And uh, while we was eating dinner in 1952 together in his godmother's house, uh, he signed this for me. And that fight was tougher than the 332nd fight. Tuskegee Airmen, because while I was a Tuskegee Airman, nobody spit in my face. But there in that march, they did. And nobody gonna stop me. I'm going, we marching on. We went to the Dallas County Courthouse and said, we're gonna have a prayer meeting on the steps here, eight of us. You're not going to have a prayer meeting in my, on my steps. You go to your church and have prayer. We're going to have it here. And the first person we're going to pray for is you. <laughs> and we're not compromising. You got a gun on you. That gun is going to rot and go back to the dirt of the earth. But we're standing here in the arms of God. We're not going to compromise. That shed 
walked back into that courthouse, and we had our prayer meeting on the Alice County courthouse steps. When you stand up and you're right, first be right, then stand up for it. And those big bad bullets, they'll crumble before your eyes. You have to give your life, give your life. There should be one thing in everybody's life that you will die for. And don't be, what is death that man should fear it, knowing it to be a necessary end will come when it will come. When you stand up, you become a man. And we completed that march. These are my heels. If you want a picture of this, buy a jet. Jet magazine dated March the 20, the 10th. March the 10th, this year, two weeks ago. And these shoe heels are in the center of Jet magazine <laughs> for March the 10th. At the 10th this year, and we're standing there besides. <coughs> Don't compromise. They're coming up now with some kind of photograph, a federal photograph, before you can vote. How many black people go around with a federal photograph in their pocket? Now they're coming around with, we'll beat that too. Show me what you got. I take my mind standing on truth and right, and I'll outmaneuver you. I'll beat you. I might lose my life, but it's best to lose your life for truth and right than to live on your knees. And that, no more, no more, no more slavery for me. Yes. What's your next question? <laughs> the next question is for Dr. Hazel Dukes. We want to ask you about when you first got your chance to meet Martin Luther King, and what type of relationship did you have with Dr. King? I met Dr. King in Nassau County, uh, in Rockville Center. Uh, he came to Rockville Center. They were doing the word is uh, gentrification now but really it was called urban renewal back at that time in the 60s. And there was a, a group that uh, had been formed, was called the Economic Opportunity Commission. And Eugene Nickerson was the county executive in Nassau County where I lived uh, in Roslyn. And I had been appointed by the town supervisor to be a part of looking at where would these people go after they took their homes uh, and some apartments from them? They were African Americans. Uh, they lived on the other side of the track. Now, this is not in Alabama. This is in New York, up south. <laughs> and, and so they invited Dr. King to come to speak to the community. And the county executive at that time I was involved in the local NAACP, asked that I ride with him to meet Dr. King. And so I had the privilege of meeting Dr. King, telling him about my family. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama, and still had family members there that some uh, had belonged to Dexter. They had married and moved to Birmingham, Alabama, and told him all of that. And so from that, we start corresponding. And then Mrs. King came, his wife, came uh, to New York City at Riverside Church before Dr. King spoke there. And it was the women group that brought her there and I got a chance to meet her and be in her company. And then uh, I'm a Delta, uh, belong to Delta Sigma Thay, and uh, Dr. Betty Shabazz was good friends with Mrs. Uh, King. And so I got a chance then to be corresponding with her. And then later, Merle Evers Williams, she's Evers Williams now, the wife of Mega Evers, who was killed before Dr. He was the first one to get killed on uh, getting people the right to vote in uh, 
Mississippi. And so they became, the three widows became very good friends. And I was a good friend to Mrs. Evers because of her NAACP involvement after her husband's death. And so I got a chance to be in her company on many occasions. At this moment, we're going to pause and then we're going to open it up to the floor to ask questions as well. Bobby, it is so wonderful to see you. Um, Marcel Hamilton, I asked him to be one of the narrators, especially for Mr. Montgomery. This didn't just happen. So there's a special connection, Mr. Montgomery, and I would want Marcel to tell you a little about it. Please share it with us. So um, some of you know I'm a commercial pilot, and a year, two years ago, I was asked to be a part of the Tuskegee Airmen Legacy Flight Academy down in Tuskegee, Alabama. So you know it's a great honor to be sitting here with you. We took about 12 kids, nonprofit. Where we taught them how to fly for two weeks. It was an amazing experience, and I actually brought some pictures to share. So if you want to, for you guys to go up here, and if you can see back here. Okay. So we took these two planes and you know, we painted them red for the Red Tail Legacy. Yes. Um, we were able to teach these people how to fly. It was amazing. This is actually on Moulton Field. Yes. So the historic Moulton Field where they, where they actually learned how to fly and where they took off and they landed. It was amazing to be there. Next picture. This is a picture of the kids. Um, kids from all over, Chicago, Washington, New York, young aviation enthusiasts. Um, my, actually, the leader, Kenyatta Ruffin, he's actually an F-16 pilot. He may be one, he's actually, the picture, the gentleman in the third row, that's him. He's actually in Japan right now. He flies out of Japan, he's an F-16 pilot. This was his whole idea. He got some flight instructors together. He said, hey, like, we need to give back to our kids. So this was us in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. Mm -hmm. We actually got a chance to tour Tuskegee University. And this is actually a picture of most of the Tuskegee Airmen. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to tell, but that's a picture of those guys. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, I'm trying to remember the, what, what kind of jet this was. Maybe you can help me out. Mm -hmm. does, does this jet look familiar? This, the jet. Does it, I don't remember the, the name slips me, but it's a phantom. Yes, this is a phantom jet. A mm -hmm. phantom jet. This was Sharp Field. So this field is very, very significant. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen, they learned how to fly on Moulton Field, and then the advanced pilots went over to Sharp Field. Nowadays, you know, those guys, they close it down. There's like construction going on, but we were able to actually tour Sharp Field. And that's, that's the barracks, the 332nd fighter group. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's the barracks right there. Actually, I think the next slide is actually, um, we got a picture of the dormitory. It was amazing because you actually saw like old picture frames and old desks and old tables where they used to, to learn. Mm -hmm. This is Moulton Field. Yes. Yeah. This is Moulton Field. This is history. Wow. And that's Legacy Flight Academy. We brought some kids. I think the next, the next one is going to be next year. We actually got it approved by the Air Force Academy. It's going to be in Denver, Colorado. I, I, there's one more, there's one more picture. And we actually got a chance to do some formation flying. I'm sure you know all about that. We got a chance to take the red tails up, do some formation flying over to ski. It was beautiful. And there you go. There you go. Nothing happened by accident. I remember when Marcel first started learning to fly and I was so excited because I said someone thinking out of the box doing something out of the box not knowing how God bring things back to a circle it is just so wonderful he had to share this at this moment we're going to open it up to the audience to ask questions to Dr. Hazel Duke and to Mr. Montgomery I'm, uh, recently I was reading something. Well, could you please enlighten me about this because I'm always reading about the Tuskegee Airmen. I learned that they also were, most of them were also pilots and they were also aeronautic engineers. Is that true? They, they were aeronautic engineers and some of them were also pilots. So they had two majors. They were majoring in pilot flying and also fixing the plane. Is that right? Gunners, 
gunners, what they, who they called gunners. They had um, the uh, bombardiers. These men had at least one to two years of college before they uh, were you know, admitted to fly. They had to be educated. And then many of them left. When they left the uh, armed services, they continued their education. And many of them became commercial pilots. But that's true to your question. Mm -hmm. I just want to continue the excitement. I'm so excited this afternoon. I just yes. want to t encourage the young people. As you said, don't give up and drop out of school. We know racism is not going to go away. It will always be there. But whatever you have up here, nobody can take it away. Um, when um, this lady, when Rosa Parks died um, a few years ago, one of her friends, were, um, she was among the, the, um, the, the, the guests who were, the bereaving guests. They went to school together in the, in in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. And they claimed that um, missionaries from the Church of Scotland, which is Presbyterian, right? They opened a school, is, um, was it in Alabama where she was from, I think? Mm -hmm. They opened a school for girls because there were no schools. The black children couldn't go to school. And she said every one of them graduated at the end of the period, the high school period, in 1936 or something like that. I mean, compared to the dropout rate we have now, what, what has happened? Somebody from the NAACP could help me here, because I wasn't born in this country. I don't know the whole system in the school, how it worked. How did they graduate, the, the entire class, Rosa Parks and her friends, you know, missionaries came from Scotland and opened because the school. Because people wanted education. Mm -hmm. These kids don't want it. They, 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 but what they is, have, those persons had to walk to school. Buses stand, buses come by the corner. Mm -hmm. And they'll get on the bus and get off at the next stop. Yeah. But also, parents, we've lost. Parents ought to be parents. Anybody that stay in your house is a school age. It's your job as the parent to tell them if they live in your house and eat your food and wear your clothes that they are going to school and be educated. But when you don't have parents, and I don't mean just the biological parents, I mean the community, I mean the grandparents, I mean the church, all of us had to be, that's how children was reared. Hillary Clinton didn't phase it takes a village to raise a child. No, no, We've no. been knowing that as African American community. Uh -huh. It was aunt, uncle, you didn't hear anything about foster care. Family took care of children. And so that's, yes, they all graduated because they had a yearning for education. But the people around them instilled in them, that was the way to get ahead. And we don't have that coming from home. You can't put it on the school. It starts in a home. Regardless of where you're from, whether you're from Trinidad, whether you're from Barbados, it starts at home. Right. Okay. And if home can't control their own household, how you think anybody else is going to do it? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Montgomery and Ms. Dukes, I have a question for each of you. My first question will be to Mr. Montgomery, and this has to do, let me come over here. Hi, Mr. Montgomery. Yes. My question has to do with the Tuskegee experiment. Experiment? Yes. Yes. And I would like you to speak to that, because I know a lot of people don't have any knowledge about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Miss Dukes, I remember you and all the trials and tribulations you went through with Mr. Giuliani, and I just wanted you to give us some of the background of all the protests and all the activities that you were involved in in the 70s and 80s and even before that. Thank you. The Tuskegee experiment was a combination of men and women working together 
Notice I said in the beginning that every pilot you saw up there in a fighter plane, that was 13 to 15 people on the ground supporting him. So you had photographers. You had uh, uh, people in my outfit were food and supply. We furnished food and supply for the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, other people furnished other things for the Tuskegee Airmen, but all coming together, supporting that idea. So sometimes we take the attitude of, uh, they don't recognize me because I'm not at the top. You are at the top as long as you're doing something for the cause. The top has to depend on the foundation of the mountain in order to stay up there and to function. So as long as you are doing something for people, to improve people, you are at the top and you are important. Very, very important. Don't let anybody tell you that you're not important. You are important. You're working on the base of the mountain, you are important. D. O. Davis was indeed a mighty force in that he had gone really before us to West Point, four years there. Mm -hmm. And they kicked him around, wouldn't speak to him. And he stood up and said, I can. And he came out number 37 in a class of 285. You see? And that made him tough, tough. When things get tough, you get tougher for right. And he passed that down to us. I never saw him smile. I saw him many times, but I never saw him smile. He was stirred down to the point. And he's there with you. And he inspired us. Yes. So you are important. This is what I want to emphasize. You are an important person, wherever, whatever you are doing. All right. Yes? Oh, that, um, I want to talk about the uh, yes. years here in New York City that has been uh, somewhat turbulent for African Americans. Uh, under the former mayor, Dave Dinkins, he tried to bring the city together. Giuliani, when he became mayor of the city of New York, decided he was gonna have two cities. He was gonna have one for those who were white and one for those who were African American and poor. He started his model by a division of some African Americans against others. Uh, he took the model that Staten Island was the best borough in the city of New York and that the other boroughs, Queens and Bronx, they ought to just disappear because they had too many poor people in there. And so on the, uh, for his first 100 days, I decided to write an op-ed about him, what he was doing. And of course, he was a mean man, and he decided that he would tackle me. Uh, but I decided that I could speak out and would speak out. And so for his whole four years, we fought. Uh, he went after me, and I went after him. And the uh, uh, last mayor, city of New York, his first term, he was sensible. You could talk to him. 
his last four when he bought his term with his money he decided then that he would be a dictator and he would dictate what you could eat what you should drink what time you went to the park what time the park closed and so I decided I was going to use the law. So I brought lawsuits against him. Time and time again, won some and lost some. It will take what this man did to the city, and especially in education. Now, I, as NAACP, we are celebrating this year 60 years Brown versus the Board of Education. Do anybody in here know what Brown means? Brown meant separate was unequal. The late Kenneth Clark and his wife did a study to show how our children function. Every time they showed a African-American child a white dog, they wanted the white dog. Because what Mr. Montgomery have said to you, they had no confidence. Nobody had told them they, that black was beautiful and don't crack. <laughs> but they didn't, nobody had instilled that into them. And so what has happened in this city now, we have taken, and I want to be very clear on this, Parents have a right to send their children any school they want to. But the majority of children have to go to public schools. Because I have friends who are paying for their children in the first and second grade at Banks College $40,000 a year. They are blessed. They work at Verizon, they vice presidents, they work down on Wall Street, but the majority of our community is, do not make that kind of money. They're struggling just to have housing and food and clothes. So I have to fight for the least of these. And that's where I fight. For who much is given, much is expected. And so since I know the law, and since I have lawyers around me, I have to fight for the least of those in our community. And so I fought Giuliani. He began to take, we had CBOs, that mean community organizations. He started taking our community organizations and giving them to Catholic charity, all the big places. They didn't care anything about our communities. They treated them. I went to court, fought him, I won that suit. The NAACP won that suit against him. The last mayor, what he's done in education, he has let some Wall Street people who live in Connecticut, do not live in New York City, but have taken our children and using them as guinea pigs talking about they are learning more than the public school. Well, if I don't have, you can be all genius, but if you have more than 25 children in a classroom, you cannot teach. And what happened was I sued him because the state law say you should not have more than 25 children in a classroom. In some of the classes in New York City, we have 35 and 40 kids. And, and when they co-locate in our public schools, they have taken away art. Our children have to eat lunch at 10 o'clock in the morning, 10.30 in the morning. Our kids can't even go on the playground while they see other children playing soccer on the ground. Our children is sitting in classrooms where peeling lead paint. But when the co-location come, they take those classrooms and paint them, make them beautiful in color, 
And then they have ch people teaching our children who have never taught their own dog. Their nanny walked their dog. So what do they know so much about our children? And we have to work hard to get a master's degree. When Wall Street crashed, they put in a program in City College that they could go back and get a master's degree and come into the classroom to teach our children. They had never been trained. They had never, they had not ever had any children of their own. When they had them, they didn't rear them. They had nannies taking care of them. And so they come into our classroom and take our children and say our children can't behave. The next thing you know, they're in special ed. That's, that's the start with the pipeline to the prison system. And so I decided that I was going to fight for our children. I started with Giuliani and I kept it up with this one. And now I believe that Mayor de Blasio understand that this will not work for our children. This will not work. Our children should not be segregated. Our children should not be in the same school where some children get better treatment than others. That we cannot have that, but it takes all of us raising our voices. It's wrong. As Mr. Montgomery say, when it's wrong, it's wrong. You should stand up for justice and for what is right. Christians cannot be silent. That's why we're celebrating the crucifixion. Somebody has to die for right. Martin Luther King did not die for some millionaires. He was in Memphis with garbage workers because they were not being treated equally. They was not getting a fair wage. Two weeks ago, I marched 10 miles from JFK to LaGuardia with the workers at the McDonald's. Those people work hard. They work two and three jobs. Why can't they get a decent wage? On the same note, Dr. Dukes, do you believe in charter schools? And if you do, um, how can we increase the numbers in the minority neighborhoods? Well, I don't believe in them myself. I believe in public education. And I believe that we should put the money in public education and, and make it be what it is. When you, listen, when you don't pay teachers, what we have a system the people the teachers in Nassau County and in Westchester make more than the teachers in New York City that's not good that's number one and I'm saying if a teacher can't teach whether they black white or green get them out of the classroom I don't want nobody miseducating our children but I don't see why we can't, I went through public schools. How many of you all went to public schools? Were they good? You know why they was good? Your parents took interest in your schooling. You better not have come home without any homework. You better not have come home and watch television and play video games all evening. We gotta go back to home. I'm like Steve Harvey. I'm sick and tired of us blaming everybody else. Parents have to be parents. If a teacher, if your child come home and tell you they don't have any homework, you ought to be in that classroom the next day. You ought to know why. And then you should make sure 
that that child do their homework. You should not have anybody on the computer playing games all night. They should be sleeping and going to school the next morning to learn, not to video game. So any parent, any group want charter schools, that's fine. But I am going to fight as long as I have breath in my body to make public education for all our children. We got children in Harlem where we community board tier. We have an influx of Africans coming in. None of them speak the same dialect. We got some speaking French. If you don't have the resources in the classroom, how are those kids gonna learn? We have kids who have not seen a doctor since they were born. They have hearing problems, emotional problems. And you take one teacher gonna do all of that with a class of 40? In the charter schools, they cherry pick. Charter schools don't take in and everybody. But public school have to be like the church, whosoever will. Let them come. Mm -hmm. See, we, we have a question. Another thing, in the charter school, they can expel you. And where you going when they expel you? You see? And in that public school, they stick with you. And in that charter school, if you're not in that top bracket, they just put you around. We have and when they send you back mm -hmm. to the public school, they don't send the money back with you. And our children who are in the public school now, children are seeing the psychologists, they're seeing their social worker in closets because they've taken the space. They're curtains. We should not sit silent by and let people do that to our children. Our children is the most precious resource that we have, regardless of how they got here, who are their mother, who their father, it is our children. And if we don't raise up another race of children and not prison systems, shame on us, we ought not to have no holiday honoring Martin Luther King because she was spitting on his grave. You should stop being hypocrites. And Mr. Montgomery told you, you ought to have something beside your house, your car, and your clothes ought to be worth living for because people gave their life for you. You would not be sitting here. We have a question on the balcony. Hello. My question is for um, Dr. Dukes. Um, what is the process of becoming a member of the NAACP? Where do you live? So you just fill out an application in your fill area? Fill out an application. And I was, that's the reason I asked you where you live, because we have branches. There is a branch here on Linden Boulevard, the Jamaica branch in NAACP. There's a branch in Brooklyn. There's three branches in the Bronx. There's a branch in Corona East Elmhurst. There's a branch in Northeast Queens. And all you have to do is go on the internet, fill out the form for your student. Yes. Ten dollars. You 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 can't buy nothing for ten dollars. <laughs> but you can belong to the NAACP for ten and thirty dollars. Cheapest thing going. And when you join, you put your address in, and then on the other side, it should tell you where the nearest branch is that you can become a member. Okay, thank you. And remember that a voteless people is a hopeless people. A voteless people is a hopeless people. But that's why we're not getting respect. That's why we're not getting respect, because our people won't vote. 
but they want everything. My hearing. Experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the question was, uh, what did I mean when I said a few uh, minutes ago, Tuskegee experiment. Tuskegee experiment was an effort to try out these black young men to see can they really work and fight and be stand up and be men. They had a person by the name of Mrs. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt who came down during this turmoil to Tuskegee and asked to be flied in a plane by a black pilot. And they gave her a white pilot. And they said, not that one, I want a black one. And then they gave her a black one. She went back to Washington, D.C. and told her husband, now you, as President of the United States, I want you to use all of your power and influence to see to it that these black young men get a chance to learn to fly because I have flown with one and I know they can fly. Many times, uh, they didn't want the Tuskegee Airmen to escort them, the bombers, on a trip overseas, or, I mean, to the enemy line. And they were losing so many B 17s and B 24s until they said, We got some colored boys down there. Let's try and get them to escort us over the, uh, the, the, the enemy line. We never lost a bummer. Yes. And they start requesting us to come and escort them across into enemy territory. Give her the mic. I thought when she said the Tuskegee experiment, I thought she was talking about the Tuskegee Airmen and their experiment. Uh -huh. But she was talking about the Tuskegee experiment, the syphilis, syphilis. that was, that was uh, imposed on the black men back in the 1920s. Can you speak on that Tuskegee experiment where they, uh, uh, tested the men with syphilis. Yeah, in Tuskegee, Alabama, they injected 400 black soldiers with syphilis disease to see what would happen. They didn't treat them, they didn't do anything. And uh, it broke up many homes because a man, a soldier would go there for treatment and they would give him no treatment and went back home and would give his wife a venereal disease. And she wanted to know, where did you get this from? They had, the government had given it to them and didn't give them treatment and just let them float out. That's the type of treatment that we were exposed to. Yes. I think it's enough. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, um, actually, I want to just remark on the uh, incident that, that happened. The question. Mm -hmm. Yes. The incident that took place with the Ku Klux Klan shooting, would you have, I haven't heard much about them doing anything for a while. What would, what, do you have any insight on what my, they might be planning? Are they just coming out of hiding or? <laughs> they never went in hiding. <laughs> they never went in hiding. They just shot up some Jews last week. Yes. Uh, these, these extremist people, uh, someone had just mentioned, uh, Adolf Hitler's birthday was the 20th of April, around the 20th of April, and some crazy people around the world celebrate his birthday by doing crazy things. This man in last week's paper thought he was shooting up Jews around uh, the birthday of Adolf Hitler. 
and it turned out to be Christian working in the Jewish center that he shot. This is how off-minded those people are. And some of them are in the Senate of the United States. And they're out there, they're taking their hoods off and put vested suits on. And they're trying to make laws that will make it difficult for people who are black to vote. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, in the balcony, we're going to have our last question. My question to you is, how did you feel fighting for your country and coming back to such a segregated a society where they were spitting on you, abusing you? How did you feel? How did I feel? Yeah. Oh, well, when I was going, I was drafted. And when I was going to fight, I had faith in God and hope that something positive would come out of this. And I don't care what happened to me during this period of time, I believe that something good would happen. When I stood up in the courthouse after the war was over and the lady told me I couldn't vote, I said, something good is going to happen as a result of this. And I have to be out there doing it. I cannot wait around for somebody else to do it for me. I have to get out and do it. Never lose faith, never lose hope. If you look at the statue of Martin Luther King in Washington, D.C., he stands there with his arm folded, but read his lips, he is saying, don't compromise, don't compromise when you are right. Stand up, stand up, feel good about yourself. I would like, let me two questions have been read by young people. It's unfortunate that the curriculum in your school do not teach you. But you can go on the internet and read bios of African Americans. You can educate yourself on who you are and what is about your race. Ku Klux Klansmen are your next door neighbors. They own the grocery stores in your community. They own the banks. I don't want to go to Washington. I'm talking about right here. See, we look too far away. We're not paying attention to where we live. Your own space. When people come in your neighborhood and won't hire anybody to look like you, but yet you continue to go in that store and shop and complain to us about they won't hire anybody. Well, they wouldn't hire themselves if you wouldn't go and shop. When Rosa Parks decided to sit on that bus that day, for 365 days, African Americans did not ride the bus. We do nothing but complain. And our children hear us complaining, and they don't have the self-esteem that Mr. Montgomery is talking about. Stop looking at Washington. Look at your own borough president. Look at your own mayor. Look at your own city council person. Look at your own uh, uh, assembly person, your senate person. You ought to know how they vote. Don't just go and vote. You shouldn't have any permanent friends and no permanent enemies, just permanent interests. That's what the other groups do, and we don't do it. That's why they respect it. That's why they get what they want, because that's the way they play the game. It's a game, and we are not in it. We're just complainers. I would be remiss if I didn't say thank you um, to Dr. Dukes myself. Myself and my two brothers, we all received NAACP scholarships to go to college. I am an attorney, my brother is a doctor, and my other brother is a published author and professor. 
So I just want you to know that the money that we received to help us pay for our college education, we used it, and it really helped us to be able to achieve our dreams. Thank so, you. Thank you. Young people, did you hear that? Go on the internet. Stop playing the games and go and learn what's there for you. And watch the amount you pay for those tennis shoes. <laughs> I understand it was lines around uh, 125th Street this morning, paying $250 for sneakers. But you see, that's, that's again in the home. Nobody would buy 250 sneakers in my house unless they had a job. But I came from the old school. I know you want your children to have more, more than you had, but that's a crazy mentality. More education, right. Okay, so we have come to a close of our AY program, and I wanna hear from the congregation, what did you think? Did you like this? So a special guest. Mr. Montgomery, Dr. Hazel. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. May God be, bless you continuously. Showers of blessing each and every moment of your life. Uh, we're going to have our first elder come and give us this moment of words of wisdom. Wasn't this a wonderful experience? We, we started with the word. And for our Vesper thought, we're going to end with the word. Take your Bibles out or take your iPhones out. We're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 9. Young people, get your Bibles out. This is something that you can benefit from. And the Bible says, keeping the trend of thought, that we had about all things are possible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, it says, because a great door for effective work has opened to us. Keep that there. And then let's turn to Philippians 4, verse 19. You should know that by heart. Because we can do all, all things. Christ is strengthened. Right. So legacy teaches us we have a great door that is open towards us. And Philippians 4 talks about we can do all things, all things through Christ. Christ Connect us. those two. And we have the living proof that we can, under the influence and the power of Jesus Christ, accomplish great things for the cause of God.